We say welcome to each one to the worship of our Lord, and we thank you for taking this time to join with us in praise and worship and also the preaching of God's word. And we trust that our worship together will prove to be a blessing to all those that are here in this assembly and to all those who will join us later by the way of television and internet. Your prayerful support is appreciated as we seek the blessings of God on this ministry. For our call to worship this morning, we ask that you join with us in singing the hymn, Search Me, O God. For those in our congregation, you'll find that on hymn number 481. Shall we stand as we sing together? Search me, O God. me
want everybody to get their hymn books and turn to page 693. Stand. If you know that's going to be a great day when we see the one who loved us and gave himself for us, Amen. one who washed all of our sins away at the cross of Calvary, and we're looking forward to the coming of that great day. Stand, if you will, and sing with the choir the second verse again as Jack leads. There be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain. No more parting over there. Yes. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Oh, what a day. I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through that promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. Give the Lord praise. <laughs> I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing completely saves he will lift you by his love out of the angry waves he's the master of the sea billows his will obey he your savior wants to be be saved
26. Verse 31. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen, I will go before you into, into Galilee. Peter answering and answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I will never be offended. We, miss, we, we, we ought to watch what we say. You ever heard the story of eating words? Well, Peter ate some words here tonight. He, he ate some words that night in, in, in the scripture. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, This night before the crock crows, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. Likewise, listen, likewise also said all, his, all the disciples. Then, Jesus come and, then cometh Jesus with them to the place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further, and he fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy will. And he cometh to his disciples and finding them asleep and said unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye may not, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh weak. And he went again, away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, Thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and said unto them, Sleep on, sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that do, doeth betray me. May we pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings of this day, for being able to be in your house, sing songs of Zion, lift our hands in glory and praise and honor to you. Thank you for the music and the singing, and thank you for the praising of our, of our church to our Heavenly Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we look into the words of God today, I pray for the anointing, the filling, the Holy Ghost upon me this morning, that I be the vessel to bring the message that you have sent to us. May we search out the scriptures. May, Father Lord, you be honored and glorified. May the Church of the Redeemed be encouraged, saints be refreshed. And then, Lord, if there's any today that's lost, may they come to know Christ in pardon and forgiveness of sin. And when it's all finished and this hour is done, we we'll lift our hands to heaven and say great to, uh, glory to God, great things you have done. In Christ's name, amen. Look with me in verse 39. This is our text. And he went a little further. And he went a little further. And he fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he went a little farther. This, this thought has been on my mind for a couple months, I guess. I ride down the road and I hear that song and he went a little further and God just burdened my heart. This morning I want to try to just give you a few thoughts on Christ went a little further. Man, when I read the story of the disciples, 
I see us, you and me, mankind. You see, man, as great as we think we are, or not as great as we think we are. Maybe we need to say that again. Man, as great as we think we are, or not as great as we think we are. These disciples says, Christ, Lord, there's no way we're going to deny you. There's no way we're going to leave you. We don't understand what you're saying that we're going to scatter. uh, Peter says, no way, I'll die for you. And all the rest of them said the same thing. But we see what happened. Man, as an inf- just as an infight being, has many weaknesses. Just, just man in our human condition, we have many re- weaknesses. One thing I noticed, Christ didn't get rude with his followers. Christ did not even rebuke his disciples. You see, Christ recognized in our text, and what he said is recorded in verse 41, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Christ was correct when he said all his disciples would flee. They all fled. They all fell. We sometimes boast and brag and we, we talk about we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we are great men and great women and we need to be careful what we say. There are some things that we say that doesn't taste good with salt and pepper going down and a whole lot of it probably tastes like crow. But man in our mere human condition is weak in our flesh. Even though in our spirit we really want to do what's right and in our spirit within us we want to love God and we want to be the best Christian that we can be, but our flesh is weak and Christ recognized that. You see, since the beginning of time, man has always been trying in their own heart and in their own way, and they're still doing it today, to find and worship a supreme being and find eternal peace or peace in eternity. But because of man's weakness, we're doomed to failure in doing so. As I look around this world and I see all these people worshiping all these gods and worshiping all these manners, not going anywhere except to hell because they haven't come to know the true God, the Lord Jesus Christ. But God has provided for his mankind or for his created mankind a way of salvation that they might know him and worship him and have a personal relationship with him and that they might spend an eternity with him. May I tell you this morning that Jehovah God, the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, And God, Holy Spirit, came to where we are, created a way of salvation, paid the cost of our salvation. No other person can be worshipped that can be said of, of them that they've done that. You see, all the religions of the world demand that men do something in their own efforts to appease or attract favor from their God. God says all he wants from us is believe the finished work that he done through his son on the cross of Calvary. But in our weakest condition, in our most weakest state in the flesh, God changed our direction. And God provided for us who were doomed to failure in our flesh a way of escape, and that is called salvation. Listen to this. Paul writes in Romans 5, 8, But God commended his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
May I say to you this morning, that simply says that God sent forth. God gave. God made manifest His love towards us. Don't ever forget this, that we love Him because He first loved us. May I tell you this morning, until somebody comes to know the love of Christ, they do not know love and do not know how to love until they know the love of Christ. But yet while we were yet sinners in the weakness of our iniquities, that's what that means. While we were yet headed for hell, while we were yet on a road of destruction, while we were yet filled with the iniquities and sin and corruption and defilement of following Satan and his demonic forces, God chose to love us. God chose to send forth his love in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to die for us on the cross of Calvary. Romans 8, 2 and 3 says this, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ hath made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. You see, God is taking care of the weakness of our flesh problem. We, according to the law, or the law uh, demanded, the Old Testament law demanded that we live, do, do this, and we do that. But God says it's impossible for men to, to live clean enough and holy enough and pure enough to come to me. I will provide a way, and that way is Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. So God sent in His own Son in the likeness of our sinful flesh, died on the cross of Calvary for our sins, that we might have the righteousness of God in us. So when our text first says, He went a little further, He went a lot further. He did so for us. He did so because he was God-man. May I tell you this morning that the Word of God teaches, and I fully believe that that Christ was 100% man. Walked in, in flesh just like we did. Carried the same pains of our body and the same problems of our body. But yet the Word of God says that he was 100% God. Thus, because he was not only 100% man, but 100% God, he had the power to go a little further. And he did this for all mankind. You see, where we could not go, he went. What we could not do, he done. What was impossible with men is not impossible with God. For there is nothing impossible with God. So as we look at this thought on how much further Christ went, For mere mortal men, how much further he went than we could go. First of all, I want to bring to your attention this morning that Christ went further in submission to the plan of God, his Father. Christ went further in his submission to the plan of his Father God. In 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21, we have this recorded in Scripture. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed of corruptible things such as silver or gold from your vain conversations received by the traditions of your father, but by the precious blood of Christ. Boy, I love that. But by the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who, was for, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your hope and faith may be in God. You say, what are you saying, Pastor? Before this world was ever ever created, before our Lord Jesus Christ ever stood out on nothing as we find recorded in the book of Hebrews, and by the power of his word created everything that is, everything that ever will be, Somewhere in the eons of time in the, before that, in the foreknowledge and the fullness of the Godhead, he knew that his creation that he was yet to create, boy, this goes really deep in Scripture, listen, 
Before he, before he created the, the ones that he created, he knew that his created beings would fall into sin. And there must be a way of redemption. And so that way of redemption was that the Father told the Son, I want you to go to the cross of Calvary because you're the one without spot and without blemish. And as, as John said, behold the Lamb of God that cometh to take away the sins of the world. He told the Son, and the Son agreed, the Lord Jesus Christ agreed, that he would go and die for sinful men. May I tell you this morning that God had a plan for mankind. It was, it was centered around the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he went into full, complete, holy submission to his Father's plan. I want to tell you this morning that God has a plan for you and I, and what you and I need to do is follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ and submit totally and completely to God's plan for our life. You say, what is it? It's found in the recorded pages of Thus Saith the Lord, the Word of God. Amen. Christ went further than any man could ever go. He came into this world and completed his Father's plan for the redemption of sinful and fallen man such as you and I. My friends, if you know that and realize that and appreciate the fact that he submitted himself totally to the will of God, give him praise and glory in his house this morning. <laughs> Secondly, Christ went further in, sur in surrender to the will of God his Father. Christ went further in surrender to the, his Father's will. John 5, 30, Christ says, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Christ surrendered his will, his human nature, his human will, to the will of his Father, Jehovah God. As we read in our text again in, 20, in Matthew 26, 39, he says this, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy wilt. He says, Father, what I really want in the flesh is not important. What I want is not nearly as important as what your will is. May I say in verse 42, it says, And he came and he went away again the second time and prayed, saying unto his father, If this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. He says again in verse 44, And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Three times our Lord Jesus Christ went to the throne room of the Father. Three times he prayed and asked the Father if it would be possible that the cup of separation and the cup of shame not be drinking. Three times he went to the throne room, made his request, but three times he committed himself he surrendered himself to doing the complete will of the Father. What was the will of the Father? That a sinless man die for sinful man. You see, he was the only one that could carry out the Father's will of salvation of sinners. Why? Because he's the only one without sin. He's the lamb without spot and blemish. He's the only perfect one. Oh, I hear pre preachers, sometimes these liberal preachers talk about that it was been impossible for Christ to live without sin. I want to tell you that's a story straight out of the regions of the damned. Jesus Christ was sinless. He never had a sinful thought. He never done a sinful deed. He never spoke a sinful word. He was perfect and pure and clean. He was God. He was God in the Son dying for sinful men. If you are thankful for his complete commitment to doing the will of God, then you and I ought to be completely committed and surrendered to doing the will of God in our life. 
And if we know that will, let's get busy doing it, but let's give him praise and glory in his house that he committed himself in total surrender to the will of God. He went a little further. May I say to you this morning that Christ went further in suffering for sinners. Christ went further in suffering for sinners. We find that Christ suffered emotional pain, emotional heartbreak, mental stress and anger. We find recorded in Luke twenty two forty four, and being in agony, he prayed the more earnest, and his sweat was as great drops of blood falling down to the ground. In great agony. Now, when we look at the word agony, it, 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 it invokes this thought. Agony of mind and agony of heart. Painful emotions of mind and painful emotions of heart. No one's ever had the agony that Christ. No one's heart has ever been broken like Christ's heart has been broken. When I think about this, that he left the Father's house. He, wrote, he left all the celestial glories of the Father's house. He came into this sin-cursed world, took on him the form of us, to die for us. His heart was broken because of sinful man. His mind was torn because of sinful man. No one has ever suffered such emotional pain and agony as Christ and then they carry him into the Pilate's judgment hall. And we find in Luke 22, these words in 63 and 64. And when the men that helped Jesus mocked him and smote him, and when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on his face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? They shamed him beyond human recognition. They mocked him. You say you're God, save yourself. You say you're God, tell us who's doing this. Tell us who is hitting you. You say you're God. They mocked him. They created agony and pain in his mind and in his heart. No one's ever had such emotional agony as our Savior endured. No one's ever had such broken heartness as our Savior endured. Secondly, he suffered physical pain. Listen, not only emotional pain, but physical pain. John 19 records it this way. And then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a robe, of, a purple robe, and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with, his, with their hands. Physical pain took Jesus. The Word of God records that it took a cat of nine tails. That's a huge piece of stick with, with, with big, long pieces of leather. And on the end of that leather is woven tin and metal and stone and glass. And they stretched our, our Savior between heaven and earth, tied ropes around His hand and stretched Him up till He's standing on His tiptoes. And that old Roman soldier takes that big cat of nine tails and he hits him 39 times. And those cords of leather wraps around his body and those pieces of metal and stone and glass rips the flesh and the sinews and the muscles and the ligaments from his body. And Psalmist records, I can see all of my bones because they stare up at me. 351 stripes caused deep pain in the body of my Savior. And then they planted a crown of thorns, those thorns four to six inches long, put it on his head. The old Roman soldier took a big reed and busted him over the head with it and drove 
those thorns into his eye sockets, into his ear canals. And yes, they even, some scholars say, penetrated his skull even into the portion of his brains. And then they laid a cross on his back. As recorded in John 19, 17, and 18. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into the place called a skull, which is in Hebrew, Golgotha. And there they crucified him. There they crucified him. He laid down on that old rugged cross, stretched out his arms, and said, Drive those nails deep into my arms, into my hands and my feet. And they raised him up, dropped him in an old hole with a great thug, and his bones hurt, and his, ang his body anguished in pain as he hung between heaven and earth. Just for me, and just for you, and for all of mankind. You see, Christ suffered more than any man in the history of mankind. He suffered all of this that he might redeem us from our sins and our iniquities and make us fit by the washing of us in his blood for the family of God and that we might spend an eternity with him in heaven, giving praise and glory. Christ went further than man could ever go in the shame of the cross. Christ went further in shame, in shame, in bearing shame, in taking shame. First of all, he, went, he endured the shame of the cross. Look with me in Hebrews 12, or listen, Hebrews 12 too. Looking unto Jesus, the author of the finisher of our faith, the beginning and the end our faith, who for the joy that was set before him enjoy, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down in the right hand of the throne of God. Shameful crucifixion. Shameful. He with joy died for us. He, didn't, he wasn't shamed, shamed about dying for us. He with joy died for us. It was just the shame and the stigma of the cross. Because we find recorded in Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Cursed. You see, reserved for the worst of sinners, the worst of criminals, was crucifixion. Crucifixion was the reserved for the worst of sin, sinful men, the worst of criminals. I studied a little bit about death and the Roman death. Someone of a pretty good standing in life, maybe rich, maybe powerful, but committed a crime. They went to the guillotine. They went to the guillotine. You see, it was quick. It was easy. Oh, they died for their sin, but just with a slice of one big blow, their head falls off. They didn't suffer. For one who may be just a little bit different than that, maybe he avoided paying his taxes to Rome and he didn't do everything he wanted, the, the Roman soldiers and the Roman government wanted him to do. They would take him out and they would stand him against the wall and they would run him through with a spear or an arrow directly into his heart. He wouldn't suffer. But for the vilest of the vile, the meanest of the mean, the cruelest of the cruel, the worst, the worst mankind was reserved crucifixion. And when one died on the cross being crucified, the world looked at them and wagged their heads and said, they deserve to die. Let them suffer. Let them suffer. And with the exception of the, this, in this particular time frame with Pentecost coming, they may die. It may take them three to seven days hanging on a cross to die. Then it was customary to take that old body off of that cross and throw it down the hillside where awaited dogs and wild animals and buzzards to pick the flesh off of the bones. Had it not been for the plan of God and the friends of Christ who took him off the cross and buried him according to God's plan, 
the same would have been his result. Not only was it the shame of the cross that he bore, but Christ endured the shame because his father could not look upon sin. In the ninth hour of the crucifixion, Christ cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatai, which is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, for the first time ever, he was totally separated from Jehovah God. For the first time ever, he was totally separated from the Holy Spirit. You say, why? It's recorded in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13. Read it sometime. It simply says this, that God the Father could not look on iniquity, could not look on sin. You say, what do you mean? Listen. Christ endured the shame of sin that was placed upon him. He couldn't, Father wouldn't look on him because Christ was enduring our sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Paul puts it this way, for he, had been made, for he, God, had made him Christ to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Think about it. God the Father chose God the Son to become sin for us, that we who were nothing but sin could may be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Listen to Isaiah's account of what Christ endured for our sin, the shame of our sin. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. And we hid as it was our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him smitten, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, our failures. He was bruised for our iniquity, our sins. The chastisement or the cost of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. With every stripe he brought salvation. Yet it pleased the Lord, his father, to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and shall prolong his life, and the pleasure of the Lord shall, be, shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. You see, church, Christ endured the shame that we should have went through. He took on himself our iniquities, our sin. Whatever your sin or sins were, they were nailed to the cross of Christ in his body. His father deemed it necessary. His father made it happen. When God the Father placed on God the Son the sin of all mankind. When he made his soul an offering for sin. And after it was all over, the Father looked upon the Son and was satisfied. Because he took my iniquity. He took your iniquity. He took our sins, all of our sins, all of our corruption and defilement and buried them in his own body on the tree. Oh, he suffered such pain, such shame, the shame of the cross, the shame of the separation of the Father and the shame of of our sins. He went through it all because he loved us. Give him praise and glory.
Christ went further. Christ went further not only in submission to the plan of God, surrender to the will of God. He went further in the suffering for sinners. He went further in enduring shame. But he went further in winning supreme victory. You see, he gained supreme victory in rising from the dead. Luke 24, we find these words. Upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher, bringing spices that they had prepared and certain others with him. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Let me just, as a footnote, say this. Christ didn't need the stone rolled away. He walked right through it. The stone was rolled away for his followers and for you and I. And it came to pass, as they were, being, as they were much perplexed, therefore they wondered much. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid, they bowed their faces to, to, to the earth. And they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? That's what we need to ask this world. Why seek you the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke unto you when he was yet with you in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his word. May I tell you this morning, he gained victory over death by rising. And because he raised, we will also rise with him. He gained supreme victory over Satan. He gained supreme victory over Satan. It's recorded in Revelation 1, 17 and 18. And when I fought, John, John recorded this. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me and said, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am Alpha and Omega. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of death and of hell. He gained supreme victory over Satan. You see, Christ walked into the heart of hell. Looked the devil in his eye. Can you get this picture? I thought about this this week as I looked at this. The devil rejoicing. The devil rejoicing. He looks over at his number one demon. Maybe the Antichrist was there. Or the false prophet. And he says, we've got it made, folks. We killed Jesus. We killed Jesus. And all for a day or so, they were happy. They were having themselves a blast. But then comes one running into the chambers of hell into the throne of the devil and said, Satan, Satan, we got a problem. Oh, I ain't got time to hear. No, we got a problem. Listen, I ain't got time to hear you, demon. I'm having a good time. You better hear me. You know the one that we call Jesus? They call Jesus. You know the one that we had hung on the tree? You know the one that was buried? You know the one that stopped breathing? You know the one that we killed? We got a problem. We didn't do it. He's alive and he's headed your way. He walks in as only a resurrected Savior could do. Looks at the devil in the eye and says, I want the key to your domain and I want the key to death. You'll no longer bother people in this manner. You say, what happened? I believe trembling as only Satan could tremble. He didn't argue with Christ. He didn't fight with Christ. He knew he had lost the battle. He gave him the keys of his own domain. And he stands victorious today, having won that victory and holding in his hand the keys of hell and of death. Therefore, death should have no horror to the child of God. 
You see, he gained supreme victory over death and the grave. It's recorded in 1 Corinthians 15, these words, So also the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption and raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor and raised in glory. It is shown in, sown in weakness and raised in power. It is sown a natural body but raised a spiritual body. It is sown a natural body and there is a spiritual body. It, and, it is, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last man, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. And then we find in that same chapter in 50 through 57, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in, the moment in, the, in, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump of God shall, trumpet shall sound, and the dead, of, dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall it be brought to pass, saying, that which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, but the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God, which give us us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. May I tell you this morning, the grave holds no fear. Death holds no fear to the child of God because he goes with us through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil because he is with me. He guides me. His rod and his staff protects me. I want to tell you this morning because he lives, we can live also. Because he lives, we can live abundantly. Because he lives, we can live eternally. I want to tell you this morning that Christ won supreme victory and we know him as our Lord and Savior. We enjoy this victory also. Give him praise and glory. Shout hallelujah. Praise be the Lamb. Well, glory. But Christ went further in sacred service. Christ went further in his sacred holy service. You see, Christ in sacred service is to us, our priest, and he sprinkled the mercy seat of the holies of holies with his own blood. Listen to this, recorded in Hebrews 9. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood entered into the holy place once entered once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us then he goes on to say this saying that this is the blood of the testament of god hath enjoined unto you moreover he sprinkled the blood of the tabernacle in all the vessels of ministry when christ rose Victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Defeated Satan and sin on our behalf. He takes his blood and marches into that holy of holies. And if you know anything about scripture, it says on that particular day that the tabernacle, the, the, the curtain in front of the tabernacle, in the tabernacle in front of the holies of holies was rent from top to bottom signifying that God had opened the holy place for all of mankind. And Christ takes his own blood, goes to the mercy seat, which is the glory seat of God, the Shekinah glory of God dwelt there, and he sprinkled with that mercy seat with his own blood. But wait a minute. That's what the Old Testament priest used to do, but he went a little further. You say, what does it mean? It says that he took his blood and sprinkled all the vessels of ministry. That's the first time that it happened. He, our high priest, in service of redemption to all mankind, once and for all, opened the throne room of God to mere mortal men who know him in forgiveness and redemption of sin. But he went a little further in sacred service 
For the fact is, he is now our advocate or our lawyer in heaven. 1 John 2, listen to this, my little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. That big word propitiation simply means the price paid. Not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Not an elect few, not the white, not the black, not the red, not the yellow, but for the whole world. But get this, as it was in the days of Job, so is, is every now and then you and I make a mistake. Every now and then you and I sin. Yes, amen, we do. And the devil, the word of God rightly divided, says approaches the throne of God and says, God, did you see what he done or she done? Isn't it time to strike them down for that sin? And at the same time, Holy Spirit begins to rest our hearts. He said, you know, you've done that. Yeah, that was sin. Don't you know that you just simply need to ask Christ for forgiveness and that sin will be done? And so we bow ourselves before Christ and we say, Christ, I have sinned and I plead the blood of a cleansing. I know you forgave me at Calvary, but I don't want any, any fellowship to be broken. And about that time, Christ stands before Jehovah God and says, you can't do anything to him or her because I paid for their sins in my own blood. They're mine. They're yours. And the devil takes a hike. And Christ went a little further in sacred service because he's now our intercessor in heaven. I like what the Hebrews, writer of Hebrews says in 725, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come to him, seeing that he is ever, ever liveth to make intercession for them. Go back with me in your mind to that day that you was wretched in sin, full of iniquities and corruption and defilement. Somebody preached to you the word of God told you that Jesus loved you so much that he gave himself on the cross of Calvary for you, shed his blood on your behalf, you realizing your condition fell on your face in repentance and confession, invited Jesus Christ into your throne room, made him your Lord, enthroned him as the center of your life. And you said, yes, there's a scene that takes place in heaven when that old sinner who deserved hell and was headed for hell, comes to Christ in repentance and, con and, and confession. Holy Spirit merges us into the body of Christ. The devil in heaven says, he's mine, you can't have him. Jesus stood up as our intercessor and says, Father, he's mine, I paid the price, I accept him. You see, it was I that went seeking to save that which was lost. He's our intercessor. But not only that, Christ went further in sacred service and now is our high priest and our secure or our anchor in heaven. Listen to Hebrews 4. Seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Let us live. That's what he's saying. Let us live our profession. 